Okay, here we are. Another new edition of Celtics Beat. And I'm, I'm hoping, I'm praying, I'm, I'm looking to to the, the legends of Celtics past, whoever it is that, that I can bow at the altar to, that this is not the last game that we have to preview. This is not the last Celtics beat where we have games to look ahead to until obviously the start of next season, because this is just, it's too much fun in a general sense for it to come to an end. Now this is Celtics beat Adam Kaufman, Jared Weiss from the athletic have Valenti behind the scenes producing. He will join us again on camera soon. I promise. But Jared, first and foremost, how are you, man? I'm, I'm exhausted. <laughs> the intensity <laughs> of these games be. is so draining. It's. I mean, this series has been everything we could have hoped for. It's been absolutely just stunning to watch, and it's it's funny. It's one of those games. It's one of those series where it's because it's been so close these last like few games that mm -hmm. saying like one team like making a declarative statement is getting met with so much backlash because yeah. it's like it was so close. And it's like yeah, well, you know, the end results are the end results, and that's how these playoff series work. It's usually two teams that are equally as good as each other. And it comes down to like that last game was a couple lucky bounces, basically, or unlucky bounces and a couple historically incredible plays. Well, we'll definitely get to some of the declarative statements because there are so many of them floating around on, on Twitter and from the talking heads, radio, TV, whatever you're well aware, certainly. But, you know, sort of to your main point of just how exhausting this is, and this is for us watching, obviously you're traveling too, but not you know, we're not even the ones out there on the floor playing these games or game planning as the coaching staff or so many in, in scouts and video and so on and so forth. Like people looked at, you know, going in, into the playoffs and looking at this path for the Celtics, it was man, first round series with the Nets. Like that's like a conference finals matchup, second round series with the Bucks. That's like a conference finals matchup to that's where, a conference you finals know, matchup. Yeah. yeah, like whichever team does advance to play either the Sixers or Heat, you know, you're going to get some of that same stuff too. Although it's going to feel like probably a little bit of a letdown after, you know, the caliber of talent, these first two series, but you have to look back obviously to this most recent game Wednesday night, you know, it should be three, two Celtics right now. They collapse 14 point lead in the fourth quarter gone. And, and like you said, there were some, some monumental plays there at the end that, that we can dive into a little bit, but ju just the fact that the winner of this series, whether it's in six or in seven has to go on and win two more rounds for a championship is unbelievable. Yeah, maybe that's the – because, you know, so many people have said that they think the title winner, at least the finals team, is coming out of this series, which seems pretty reasonable. Um, but, yeah, they're grinding each other down and banging each other up so much. It seems worse in this series than some of the <laughs> other series, but that's not necessarily true. I mean, look at what Golden State has had to deal with, uh, yeah. you know, in their series. So, um, you know, all these – this is how the playoffs is. Guys go down. Uh, I mean, look at what Miami's been doing. Miami's winning and Kyle Lowry's out. Mm -hmm. Kyle Lowry's also been out pretty much the entire year. So that's how it goes. Uh, but it's, it's usually the team that wins the championship is usually the team that's healthiest. That tends to be how it goes. We'll see this year because this Bucks team, the way that they're playing right now, if they can beat this Celtics team, they, I feel like every other team in the NBA is not a, it's a harder, it's easier for them to beat than Boston. That would be a truly incredible feat if they can do that. So it's possible they can even win this championship without Chris Middleton. Um, because like, look at Giannis, like Giannis was kind of hitting that wall in the series and he really broke through it in game five. He was just spectacular. So historically speaking, th these are the numbers that people like to dive into and every series is its own animal, obviously, but people like numbers in, in what we do. So let's look at the numbers. Historically, when a series is tied to two in NBA history, the game five winner has gone on to win 82% of those series. But of course, as the Celtics chase banner 18, Jared, let's, let's live in the 18% a little bit. A lot of people want to say the series is over with that game five collapse. I am not there. I truly am not. I believe, I, I don't know who's going to win this series, but I do believe it is going seven. Do you think this series is over? No, no. I mean, I expect Milwaukee to win at this point. Uh, that's the most likely outcome, but the Celtics, like the Celtics should have won that game if they stuck to what had gotten to them at that point in the fourth quarter. And they just went really early in isolation, isolation, mismatch hunting. They also hunted the wrong matchups a lot of the time. Like they kept screening Giannis on the Tatum for ISO. That <laughs> didn't make any sense. They made a few of those mistakes. And then their, their defense was still pretty good in the fourth quarter. It was just like the box outs. They just uh, Tatum had a bunch that he messed up. I wrote about that, that on the athletic 
Horford, he missed a big one at the end when Smart got hit in the face. And then Wes Matthews was able to get the rebound and kick it to Giannis with that open three. I mean, that big open three was really what did it. Um, if, you know, if that if, even if Giannis just missed that three, Celtics probably would be able to hold on at that point. But Giannis hit a three, which never really happens. And then Drew Holiday had that just unreal snatch block on what I thought was a really good play by Marcus mm-hmm. Smart on that last play there. We can get into that. But like, the Celtics are so close in the losses that they've had ever since game one. Well, the last three games have been decided by a total of what, like 13 points, something like yeah. that. You know, somewhere in that neighborhood, I had it written down 14 points. So it's, I, I just think it's, it's foolish. It's, it's idiotic. It's short-sighted to look at, if you've watched these games in this series, and I know you have obviously, and most people listening out there have to look at these games and the way that the majority of them have been played and say, Boston can't win game six in Milwaukee. Why not? Why not? I mean, Boston's already won once in Milwaukee. Celtics are, you know, hopefully we'll get Rob Williams back and then we can get into that in a little bit, obviously, as it relates to the rebounding issue in game five. But, you know, you obviously tease Marcus Smart and he's like all it's all over my mentions. It's all over the the text chains that I'm on among Celtics fans. You know, I'm I'm all for if you want to look at that last 10 minutes or so and say the Celtics didn't deserve to win that game, they weren't ultimately the better team. They got complacent. They got, like you said, mismatch hunting. They got sloppy. They, you know, were not as aggressive. The Bucs wanted it more. They went out and they took it. Like, I'm fine with all of that. I won't argue any of that. I'm good. But to sit there and pin that loss on Marcus Smart because of a couple of plays at the end when one of them wasn't even that bad in the first place, you know, obviously there was some miscommunication there on that play with about, you know, 10, 11 seconds left, but you know, it it wasn't a bad play. As you said, he had a lane holiday came out of nowhere, came up with the block. If you want to attack smart for the bad dribble at the end and, and losing the ball and the turnover and unable to get it off the court to Tatum and that type of thing, like, fine. I just, I'm, I'm not, and I never will be one of those people that looks at an entire game and says, you lost this game. Even if, even if in a literal sense, you did, I will never look at it and say, you, you lost this game on that play. This guy cost you Marcus smarts. The reason you lost. Yeah. Smart was one of their better players in that game. Up until that point, he had made some huge plays, had had some huge defensive stops in crunch time too, up until that point. Um, and, and like, I would put it more on Tatum and Brown and their execution on both ends in the fourth quarter. Those were the things that were, I think, the more glaring concerns. Uh, Ime Odoka staying with that small lineup that was really good in the last like seven or eight quarters, basically leading into that fourth quarter. But then just they were getting killed on the glass. Their size was an issue. And more importantly, like that small lineup with Derek White out there and Smart out there, that lineup is good for getting lots of side to side movement on offense. But they were doing that ISO mismatch hunting when they had that lineup out there. So it was kind of counterintuitive because then you have Derek White space on the floor when you want, even though Grant Williams was not shooting well that night, you'd rather have Grant Williams out there space on the floor, or even I guess Peyton Pritchard. So it, it just like, I, I just thought they made a few bad choices throughout that uh, fourth quarter, but at the end, like I, smart, the, like the point about how they weren't running the play while the five second clock was going, like I, you go back and you watch it, you can see the ref, he's waving his arm counting off the five count and Horford hasn't even gone to set that pin down for Tatum. So I don't know why Horford didn't start to play. I don't know why Tatum just didn't start cutting when he didn't see Horford coming at the, the count was going either way. Smart did what smart does is he's the one that thinks faster before everybody else. And he bails them out and actually tries to get something done. He oftentimes tries to get it all done on his own. And that screwed that would screw them in this one. But like he beat Pat Connaughton and Connaughton was falling away and he had a wide open shot coming. And Drew Holiday just like came from behind and snatched it. It was an unbelievable play. And it was amazing that Drew Holiday, who's like the same height as Marcus Smart, was able to rise up and snatch the ball right. out like that. Like that was just unbelievable. On the very last the last turnover there at the end, Smart, I think Smart might have had a window right at the beginning when he got the ball to make that kick ahead to Tatum. I think the, the problem is that people always show still screenshots of when uh, like that works sometimes when like nobody's really moving, but when yeah. you're showing a fast break in transition, the still screenshot is going to be a little misleading because smart is smart's running 15 miles an hour 10 right. or whatever it is. So like that window was only there for the splittest of seconds. And so yeah. in reality, smart, if he had, if he didn't lose that dribble, because I think it was the second dribble, he kind of lost it. If he didn't lose that dribble, that would have been the moment where he could have gathered and whipped that overhead pass to Tatum. 
or he could have tried to throw it early, but he would have had to kind of like loft it a little bit to get it over the middle defensive coverage. And then that would have given Giannis some time to go close out the Tatum. Then he has to give the ball to Derek White. And I know people kept saying like Derek White would be wide open, but like Derek White is not the guy that you want taking the three at the ends. And people, you know, be, people will say like Marcus should have gotten the ball to one of their shooters uh, or like Jalen or Jason on the play where he got blocked. But then it's like, oh, but then we also want Derek White to get the shot. It's like, yeah, you kind of they're a little bit contradictory there. I, I think that if he didn't get the ball stolen by Drew, he probably was going to kick it ahead to Jalen, who was near side. And Jalen could have dribbled into a three and had a chance to try to tie it there. I think it was probably what it would have happened. But Smart fumbled it a little bit. And then Drew has like the best hands I've ever seen in my life. Well, and to your point about the screen grabs, like, I mean, go back to game one against the Nets in the last three seconds of that game. Like how much happened in the last two, oh, two yeah. and a half, three seconds where you could have grabbed any, you know, fraction of a second, what the screen looked like at the time. It all moves incredibly quickly, obviously. Those who don't like Marcus Smart, again, I, I, I don't know, I – I seem to be a magnet for them for some reason, Jared. I don't know why. Maybe it's because like I love Marcus Smart. I feel like I'm, you know, on on that on on. I won't call myself the president, but I am certainly on the board of Marcus Smart defenders. And so I feel like anytime something doesn't go right, people flock to me. And and so I'm I'm getting the text. I'm getting the mentions. Everything else. And people want to grasp it again, the end of last night's game. They they want to look at the fact, hey, they won game two with Marcus out of the game and they won the blowout. You don't even need him. You know, give Drew Holiday defensive player of the year. Marcus wasn't deserved. All the crap that I tend to hear on a daily basis here, Jared. How would you assess Marcus' play specifically in this series of what we've seen so far? He's been really good. Yeah, he's been really good. I think he's been pretty much what he's been all year. You know, he hasn't he hasn't done what Horford's done most of the series and really elevated to a different level, but I think he's been really good. And let's not forget, he is hurt. Like it's not like his quad contusion healed up in six days. Like he's playing hurt. Most of these guys are, um, he's been really good. And you know, it's funny because him and Drew holiday are very similar players. Like they have like similar distribution of their skills and all that kind of stuff. Drew's better. People have been using this as to say that smarts DPOI is a fraud. I think the important thing to understand is like Drew is the best on ball defender in the NBA, but smart get got the award because he was the central tenant to the whole system and his communication and all that kind of stuff. And his, all all that stuff. So like, you know, smart, I think deserved DPOY this year. That was a, that was a fair call. Uh, But like, yeah, Drew is probably a better individual defender. I think the stuff that he does on, on the pick and roll is a little bit better. He disrupts guys a little bit better. Smart is more of a playmaking defender who also does a lot of things great. Like he's one of the best defenders of this generation. I think like Drew's just a little bit better than him in some of those things. So just make, what makes him best when he's guarding somebody one on one and doing stuff like that. But I think Smart has created a defensive system and culture that made it fair for him to get Defensive Player of the Year. Another guy you brought him up before who has you know doubters in his own way, but in a very different way. Like people think Marcus Smart is is overrated and you know the hashtag winning plays and stuff like that it's all kind of a sham this guy rob williams his doubters come from people who just don't believe that he can stay on the floor and there's you know anytime there's an important moment he's not going to be available and i was you know pre-game when when he got ruled out yesterday i was starting to get this in, in my twitter feed about you know this it's just it's a guy you can't count on and and i said look at at, at there are times that that i could maybe go along with that when you're a month or two or whatever it is removed from knee surgery and you're still dealing with soreness in that knee, I'm not going to jump on the guy's case. It's understandable. Like he came back way earlier than I ever would have expected to in the, you know, him too in the first place. So, you know, the, the fact that Rob Williams has missed the last couple of games, I don't find shocking. Is it disappointing? Sure. You'd love to have him out there. He's a great defender. He's part of your starting five, you know, lengthens your, your bench in terms of the trickle down effect, all of that good stuff. And obviously on the glass, you know, we saw, you know, 17, five was the, the offensive rebound advantage in game five for the bucks. You'd love to have Rob Williams out there and, and hopefully, you know, put a dent in that. Maybe Bobby Portis isn't grabbing seven offensive boards against you, but I think it also needs to be acknowledged here, Jared, that when he has played, and again, it's only been a couple of games, he hasn't been that great in this series so far. No, he's been a little compromised. He's been really good. At, he's been good protecting the rim and helping to come in to stop some Giannis shots and stuff like that. But out in space, he just hasn't been that good. And they never figured out how to use him offensively because early in the series when he was out there, 
they couldn't get the ball past Lopez and Giannis in the paint. And so they couldn't do a lot of the alley-oop and drop-off stuff that they wanted to. They got a little bit better in game two, but it was really bad in game one. So there just wasn't a clear role for him. And maybe he would have found that if he was healthy. Clearly, a big part of it was that he wasn't healthy. And that's why he wasn't moving well in space. And so as far as the doubter thing, it's like, I don't know what the point of calling someone a doubter is because they doubt he can stay healthy. It's like, what is, yeah, it, what does it matter? Like, I, I think it's 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 legitimate thing to be like, oh, I'm a doubter of Marcus Smart because I don't believe in the value that he brings to the table. Doubting that Rob Williams can stay healthy, it's like, yeah, <laughs> Sure. So what does it like? What does it matter? Yeah, it he is he is injury prone. Clearly, we know it to a decent degree why, and it sucks. It's just the reality of the situation it doesn't really make you question how good of a player he is. Um, but it does. At least the Celtics. It's funny because he so dramatically outplayed his contract, but now you're seeing the injury risk is why he you know why he got the contract he did. It's still a good contract unless he like unless his career ends. It's still a good contract, but. Uh, it's it, it is really hard to build this team for the future when this guy has gotten hurt every single playoff run. So if he is out there for Game Six, and we don't know as as we sit here and chat right now, how much does he add? How much of an advantage is it for Boston, or or is it not that that big a difference to you? They you no, know, they need him for sure. Uh, there's no question about it. They need him as an option at the very least. Like Udoka's not afraid to not go to him. Like they they went away from him in a few of these games. Tice in game five, he was really good offensively at the beginning. They got a lot of pick and pop. He was really good in the pick and roll, actually. Like, they did a really nice job in the pick and roll. They got him an alley-oop. He was doing a really good job uh, good job impersonating Rob. But then in the second half, it wasn't working as well. And, uh, like, late in the game, I think if they had Rob, they would have gone to him instead of going small with Derek White. Like, I think they would have gone with him and Al out there. And you just look at the way Bobby Portis got on the glass. Like, if Rob's out there, that stuff's not happening. Even if Rob doesn't box out well, Rob will still jump up there and get the ball anyway. So those moments would have saved the day, especially just like it, it's funny because Portis won the game on that offensive rebound because Smart had the rebound and Jalen knocked it out of his hands. But, like, J- you know, they had, like, Tatum and Jalen and Smart in those rebounding positions out there. They would have had Rob in those rebounding positions. All those box outs that Tatum missed – that cost him the game, like Rob probably would have been in those spots a lot of the time. So it's, it's less about that. Like Derek white was out there and more just about that. They didn't have a, they, they didn't go double big to close it out. And that cost them when Milwaukee was double big. Let's uh, let's talk about Giannis Jared, because um, this guy is look, he's the best player in the world. I, I tweeted during this latest game that I, I, I constantly think about the fact that, uh, I mean, he didn't even start playing basketball until 2008, five years later, he's drafted and X number of years, you know, later, not even a decade. Now he's, he's the best player in the world. The guy is absolutely incredible, but it seemed like, and we, we've spent a lot of time on this in this, uh, this show, not this particular show, but the show in general talking about how do you defend Giannis? How do you, you know, you can't contain him, but how do you limit him? How do you slow him down? Obviously first two games of this series, he still had robust averages. He averaged 26 points, 11 rebounds, 10 assists, but Grant Williams, Al Horford, guys like that, they, they did slow him down. He only shot 39% from the field, 55% from the free throw line as well, was not taking advantage of those opportunities. Three point percentage. You don't really think about with Giannis, but over the last three games, again, previous averages, 26, 11, 10, 39 points. These last three games on average, 14 rebounds, just the five assists, but he's shooting 52% and he's up the percentage of the free throw line to about 64. So he's, he's raised that by about 10%. Question is, you know, why is it not working now? I, I know that people like to gripe about all the calls that he's getting and sort of a bull in the China shop mentality and, and just driving into the middle and it seems to be, he's, he's getting it, you know, almost every single time he's got a fair share of offensive, uh, you know, fouls as well, but he's, he's getting the call a lot of the time. How do you attempt to kind of go back to what was working the first couple of games? I I think they've been doing it for the most part. I I really think that it's just, I, I think it's just that like they got worn down a little bit. So Grant Williams and Al Horford, those are the two main guys that were hitting him over and over. And they just haven't been able to deliver the blows in the same exact way. Um, and so that's why Marcus Smart has been guarding on us more in the series. And he's been doing a really good job because he gets underneath him really well. 
Um, but like, so Rob Williams wasn't out there. So Tice had to guard Giannis a few times and Giannis was able to spit through him. Tice just, Tice against most of these, uh, most players out there that night was just not really showing enough power to be able to handle what was coming at him. Um, their box out discipline wasn't good. And Giannis had some nice plays, you know, off the glass, but honestly, it was shocking that Giannis scored as many points as he did because Milwaukee didn't even have a fast break point in the first half. Like the Celtics ran really clean offense. They didn't miss any shots inside, but you know, Giannis is going to get to the, he's going to get to the rack like 20 times a game. And he just scored and hit the shot almost every single time. A lot of the time, like Horford went straight up on him, walled him off, got a hand up at the ball. And Giannis just hit the shot over him. I like, I really think that this game, like last game, I think there were some discipline issues on Gian, like defensive discipline issues on Giannis. While in this game, Giannis just scored through Horford over and over and over again. Marcus has been clamoring for more of an opportunity to uh, guard Giannis. I mean, obviously not exclusively, but for for a larger role in in trying to slow him down. Do you think that's justified? Would you like to see that? Is it is it an approach that could work? Smart guarding Giannis. Yeah, more more yeah. so, you know, that much been, more than we've seen so far. They've been already doing it a lot. I mean, I'll pull up the matchup data right now, but like I feel like they've already been doing it as much as they're going to because like Grant and Horford are good matchups on them, and I, I think they've done a good job. I, they're not going to do – you can't really ask somebody to do that much better than what they're doing on Giannis um, in the way that this team is working. So uh, let's see. All right, Giannis was guarded – so five minutes by Horford, four minutes by Grant, two minutes by Smart, two minutes by Jalen. Jalen was the one that really got torched by him. Like Giannis went four for six and only two minutes on Jalen. So that's where it was. Uh, that's where it was probably the biggest issue. He went six for thirteen on Horford, two for five on Grant, and that includes the threes for like the threes they yeah. were trying to give up anyway. So in reality, he didn't. You know, he went zero for three on Grant on the ones that they were really trying to stop, and he drew a couple shooting fouls. But so. You know, I, I think it's really just – I think the biggest issue with with Giannis is we've seen a few times in these last few games, the left possessions where Milwaukee will send – people like to call it ghost screens, but basically like a player will run – like an offensive player will run near the guy with the ball to force the team to switch. But he's like very clearly not screening. He's just running – he's like running past them close enough that the defenders want to switch it. And, you know, a def- like a disciplined defense doesn't switch those. But with Giannis – Giannis is so incredible that t- defenses are scared to even just like have to adjust their stance a little bit on him, that he's just going to explode through it. So the Celtics have been auto switching on those. I don't know why they are. They, sh- they shouldn't because it's not working. Um, but so Giannis has basically found that he can just kind of like start with the ball in the middle of the floor and just walk out towards the wing and they'll send those kind of cutters past him. And the Celtics will just kind of give him whatever matchup he wants. So he'll get Tice, he'll get Jalen. And, you know, Jalen, to his credit, I think Jalen does a pretty good job uh, guarding Giannis for his size, just to, like, he's just not big enough. Um, you know, Smart, at least, has that, that crazy low center of gravity. Jalen's good against most power forwards, and I think he's been pretty decent on ball. He's just made a bunch of mistakes off ball in the series, which, you know, we've seen Jalen do a lot. Uh, but he's just not, he's not the matchup for Giannis. And so they haven't really fought to avoid those mismatches uh, in these last few games, and I feel like that's really hurt them. And I think they just did a little bit better job at fighting for that earlier in the series. But you said the two minutes from Marcus Smart. Would you like to see more? You know, four minutes, five minutes, or is that expose you elsewhere on the court? No, I uh, Grandin. I think Grandin and Al have done a really good job. I just don't see the need to to change that more. Um, there's probably a, there probably are some ways that they can change the way they're switching to get to have Smart switch on instead of Jalen Moore. So yeah, I would like. I guess I would like to see him maybe get closer to like three and a half minutes, and you get mm-hmm. Jalen down lower. So maybe that's where it comes out of. But Horford and, and Williams should be the primary defenders on Giannis most of the night. One concern, obviously, that, you know, I think a lot of Celtics fans have at at this moment is that we haven't seen a great game from Jason Tatum in his series yet. It it just, you know, it's certainly not a complete one. He had the one really bad game, but even around that, because I know he's gone for, you know, 29 plus points three times so far out of the five games. And on paper, that looks good. But then you look at some of the percentages, he's shooting below 40% for the series. He's only shooting 30% from three for the series, really bad the last few games. And, you know, I, I don't know if it's, it's the risk that he mentioned, like a, an injury that nobody seemed to even really know about until he brought it up. And then 
Um, you know, so that concern and then or if it's just kind of a, a shooting rut that he's in or if it's, you know, am I not giving enough credit to the Bucks defense? You know, what what do you attribute it to? Well, yeah, the Bucks defense has been great. I mean, he had he, it's funny. He had 34 points, right? In game five. Right. Um, but it still wasn't a thought, great game. Nobody thought he had a good game. No, he I mean, the, the thing for him was like they did a really nice job of having Giannis in that drop pick and roll coverage where he's sitting back on the screen deep into the paint. And Tatum was just getting those pull up threes over and over again, and he was missing them all. He was he's missing wide open threes. This is like this is what was happening to him before you know he had that fifty point game in Washington, and then he was shooting lights out after that. That was back in January, right? Mm. And then he was horrible shooting the ball before that on all the stuff that's his shots. He just it was just completely off. I don't know why. I've asked around; nobody has a clear answer for it. He's never had a good answer for it, but he is back in that place and. He shot two for 11, three for 10, and then over six in his last three games, which is just horrible for a guy whose game is pulling up. And, you know, he's, he's done a nice job of at least fighting to find some buckets in the mid range and stuff like that in his last couple of games. But it's not enough. It's not enough when Giannis is going off on the other end. And they need, if, if they're going to win this series, which they still could do, it's Tatum has to come in with a few huge shooting nights and playmaking nights. I was going to say the lack of a Tatum great game is, is, you know, my, my biggest frustration or, or concern in this series, it's not, it's, it's the, it's, it's that we're, you know, we're reverting back, you know, we're, we're still seeing some ugly first half Celtics moments that lead to some of these either, you know, in-game setbacks or in the case, obviously of, of game five, just flat out collapses and, and choking a game away, the, the bitching and crying at the officials from players out there on the floor. Ime Odoka has called it out, obviously, multiple times at this point, you know, but it's so visible. We see it. And it I I guess I don't I don't really understand. It's easy for me to say, right? I'm not out there on the floor. I, I get, you know, I'm watching it with everyone else. I understand it at certain points in time the officiating has looked lopsided. I can only imagine how that must yeah. feel when you're out there on the court. But you have to play through it. You have to get it out of your head. You can't allow threes going back the other way or points in transition because you're not focused. It has, you could point to those as specific moments that have literally lost you games. So how do you ignore it going forward? It's a huge issue for Tatum. I've been harping on it for a while. And I, I credit to, there are some people that complained about it like two years ago. I didn't really notice it being an issue until last year. Maybe it's just because he started taking so many more shots, but yeah, like Tatum does not get back on defense sometimes because he's upset and you see him react every single play and you see it's okay to react right away, but you got to like, you got to make that eye contact with the ref and then let it go. And I just see the lingering eye contact, the non sprinting back, that kind of stuff that it's just like jogging for like three or four paces. It's just a little too much just enough against one of the most deadly transition teams in the league. And like the best transition player since LeBron was in his prime, you know, to, you just can't have that kind of stuff. And, you know, Grant Williams is a huge culprit of it also. Um, it's funny, him and JT are tight and now Grant is complaining and yeah. you know, credit to Grant. Grant's great working the refs and like his, his communication with the refs and all that is like a huge strong suit, but he also is getting distracted. And, you know, it's funny because like Grant has always had a tough time in Boston with the coaches because, yeah, it's like for Grant, like the margin of error uh, is just so small for him because like because of his uh, size limitations and he doesn't he's not a playmaker off the bounce except for like attacking close outs on the baseline. Like so him, for him, he has to do all the little things and he has to be always smart and always on point the way Horford is. Right. Because, you know, he's basically a mini Al and you don't see Al really having those moments like Al gets mad. Al will get mad at the reps, but you never really see him just like giving up or getting completely distracted. And Grant needs to do that. And Grant does not have the luxury of not doing that. And it's a shame because Grant has been so good in these playoffs. And yeah, he's, he has definitely lost it offensively these last couple games, but he's still been good defensively and he's still been a, a big impact player for them. And it, like, those are the things that stick out. Those are the things that really piss the coaches off because the rest of the team is pretty good about not doing it, but those are the two guys that stand out. It's, and that they're not the only ones like smart Jalen will happen with those guys, but those are the two that really stand out. Want to mention, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up here in a couple of minutes, but uh, Derek white, you know, you brought him up before, obviously. And I think 
you know, it's, it's starting to get written about a little bit more, just his value to this team. And, and, you know, because people, there's a little bit of a Marcus smart thing, not, not fully, but there's a little bit of a Marcus smart thing. We've talked about this on the show in the past where, you know, people look at Derek white, they look at the box score, they don't see the points or they see the, you know, Oh, for six from the field in a random game. And they say like, this guy isn't good. He's not giving you anything, whatever uh, through five games in this series to read from uh, something Adam Himmelsbach and the globe wrote earlier today through five games, the Celtics have seven, five man lineups that have played 10 minutes or more together. White is part of each of the four with a positive net rating. And he's not in any of the three with a negative net rating. He's the only player on the team who can make that claim. The lineup of white Tatum Brown Horford smart has outscored the bucks by a blistering 31 and a half points per 100 possessions. Is Derek white not getting enough credit? That's tough because, you know, I, like I wrote about white in game two when they won it, how he went over seven from the field, but actually did some really good things on offense. White, you know, White's a basketball nerd, uh, basketball nerd's favorite kind of player because he does every little subtle thing that's not in the box score. From the way that he closes out is better than anybody else. The way that he switches and cracks back off of switches and stuff like that, those are the things where he makes huge plays there. Um, the way that he drives and kicks and he keeps the momentum going in a way that's really impressive. Like he does all that stuff really well. Those are things that most people are not going to see. But when you can't hit your shot, it's still this huge limiting factor. And that's why we're seeing like Grant wasn't closing out these games because he's not hitting a shot. And it's just hard because they, they haven't – like he's gotten better hitting a shot. He's been good. He just hasn't quite been good enough that I would say that he's not getting his credit. Because like I, mean, I, don't, I don't pay attention to – what they're saying on talk radio and all that kind of stuff. I see what's in my mentions. I'm not scrolling through Twitter or Reddit to see what people feel like. Sorry. I, I don't really, that doesn't matter to me. So much. bigger fish um, to fry you're saying it's not so much that it's just like, I don't want my, like I, I do need to know how the people, how like the public feels in general so that I can write stuff that is interesting to the public for sure. And answer questions that they have, but I'm not going to dictate my analysis on someone based on like how the public reaction is. So yeah, like the fan, like the fans opinion matters for sure. Uh, but like you also, when you're trying to analyze what's going on out there, you don't want to be clouded by the fan's judgment. So um, the like with White, I think White has pretty much been what they wanted, uh, at least in the second half of the series. But like while those numbers, like those numbers are true that uh, Adam had in the story, I think also that utilizing White at the end of the game really cost them just because of the style that they had to play with, you know, with that lineup out there. So White has been doing his job well, for sure, but it doesn't mean that White has like been the perfect solution or has been like underappreciated. No, that, that all fair, all makes sense. I, I should mention, too, we won't discuss this one, but just for, for people's numbers' sake, uh, Brown, Tatum, Horford, Smart, Grant Williams, that lineup has been used the most uh, in the, uh, you know, in general, and certainly in the couple of games where Grant's been starting since Rob Williams has been out, has been getting uh, walloped, as Himmelsbach put it, by 18 points per 100 possessions, uh, mostly by the Buck starters. So we're going to need Grant to, uh, you know, get get back to doing what he was doing the first couple of games. The other and, uh, thing to uh, close so this out, one thing I just want to say, actually, before yeah. about the lineups, I think a big part of that is that those lineups are out there um, when the Celtics had bad starts, the games, mm -hmm. and then the Celtics figured it out. And also it's a closing lineup a lot of the time. And so, you know, like they, they've had some bad closes, like, like this last one, you know, although that, that, that lineup wasn't out there except for at the very end. So, you know, the, I, I don't think that lineup is getting beat up. And also that's a lineup that has to take the brunt of the Giannis yeah. stuff throughout the game. So like, yeah, Giannis is doing great against them. Um, and then uh, what was the other point I was going to make? Um, I can't remember. So forget it. Well, the only other thing I was going to bring up with you, because I, I think I'm <coughs> testing my memory here, but when you were last on with us, I think it was in March. Uh, one of the things that we talked about was just sort of looking ahead to end of the year voting and where to the, because that was, that was what like the Celtics were really like, they were playing out of their minds. And so it was, it, that was again, sort of the, the fan reception was, Jason Tatum's in the MVP conversation and Brad Stevens is executive of the year and Ime Odoka. How is this guy after the turnaround, not the coach of the year? And, and it, it went without saying Marcus Smart or Rob Williams defensive player of the year. Like it was, it was going to be a Boston sweep, Jared. And now of course, you know, in the last few days, we've, we've got the numbers and, and, and I won't break everything down, but just to give people the results who may have missed it, it came to pass exactly the way that we discussed on the show, which is, you know, as, as we 
you know, have known for a couple weeks or whatever it's been. Marcus Smart, obviously defensive player of the year, but Jason Tatum finished fourth in the MVP. It was always a three, t- three guy race. You know, Jokic wins it. Tatum was never even really in the conversation unless to you in the conversation means top five to me, it doesn't. So he was never in the conversation. Uh, he was six, up- right? Uh, or, or six, you're right. Yeah, he was yeah. six. The, the highest he finished in any of the voting was fourth. That's what I meant mm. to say. Yeah, so six is, yeah, so sixth is where he finished. Ime Odoka, fourth in the coach of the year. And this is not me like poo pooing Ime Odoka's rookie year as, as head coach. Exceptional finish, turned things around great. Like, you know, fourth is something to be excited about. Like, it's a, again, not a negative, but he was nowhere near coach of the year in terms of the actual voting and the balloting and all that. And Brad Stevens, again, great year, great off season, you know, keep it up, Brad. We love you in this position, sixth in the executive of the year, you know, vote and, and nowhere near winning that went to Memphis. So uh, I, I do think it's okay. I think people know this most rational people who listen to this show know this, but it, it's all right to be like, you know, to, to, to get recognized, to get appreciated all the while you don't have to win every single award. Yeah. Yeah, I mean they're all they were all just on the outskirts, which makes sense because at the end of the day, Boston was like around the second to third best team in the Eastern Conference. So it wasn't like they were like Phoenix or Memphis who really separated themselves. And they were bad for a while. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of voters were probably like, This team was bad for so long. They were so insanely good for like a third of the season, essentially. But they were also were bad for so long that there's other teams that were consistently really good the entire year. And, and like most importantly, like Miami. So like Eric Spolster, I think, was third place, right? Coach of the year. Or it was because it was Taylor Jenkins, Spolstra, and then Monty was number one. I can't remember what the order was. But point is like, so Memphis was just like insanely good the entire year. And they were great without without John Moran. So totally makes sense for Jenkins to be ahead of you made there. And they had a better record. And then with Spolstra, it's like the team had nobody healthy the entire year. He was starting his eighth and ninth men constantly throughout the year, was willing to bench their guy that just gave a huge five-year deal on Duncan Robinson for a former Celtics two-way. They got let go. Yeah. For second round, <laughs> I forget what Seuss's contract was. But so like, like Spolstra probably deserves it ahead of Ime just because he made something out of nothing and still got the one seat in a way that was pretty incredible. So like – yeah, those three ahead of Eman makes total sense. As far as executive of the year, that's voted on by the actual executives. And Zach Kleiman winning for Memphis tells me that they were valuing long-term building, which is how we should be doing that award. Like that award should be figured out over the course of time and seeing how years and years of work paid off rather than what Steven said. What Steven said an incredible one-year makeover, mm-hmm. which is spectacular. Um, but that doesn't mean you have to give it to him for doing that. You can give it to like James Jones in Phoenix for putting together this team that has really finally turned into a super juggernaut after they surprised us by being one last year, you know, stuff like that. So I totally understand why Stevens would have been a little bit further down the list. And then Tatum, like anybody that thought Tatum was top three in MVP, like that would be silly. And then you get to that next tier where you got book who was the best player on the best team in the league by a mile. That's a good reason to vote for him ahead of Tatum. And I think, Booker and Tatum are pretty much in the same place as far as their impact at this point. Booker's a better offensive player. Tatum's a better defensive player. So, you know, they're, they're pretty much in the same tier. You can, you know, it's hard to choose which one's better for sure. Um, and then Luca, who like Luca was just better than Tatum offensively. And you could probably say Luca has more responsibility on that team. He's running point at a level that Tatum isn't quite doing. And the different, like the the talent around him is at the same level as what Tatum has around him. And Luca's numbers were just like insane. He was averaging like, what was he averaging? Like a 40 point triple double basically for the last two months of the season while Tatum was doing really well, but wasn't quite Mm -hmm. at that same level. So yeah, I think Tatum's place, the MVP uh, MVP voting made perfect sense. I probably would have had it like right around that same place. I think I was, I was definitely, I don't have a vote, so I didn't really end up trying to figure it out. So I just, I don't really care to actually make the decision myself, but like, I, I think I probably had Tatum maybe like in the middle of that pack between Booker and Doncic, I think. It's probably where I had him. All right. Last thing, game six, who wins? We're coming back to Boston. Ah, I like it. I like I it. Didn't, oh, I'm coming back to Boston. I don't, yeah, you're coming back I, regardless, I think, but you're going to bring the yeah. Celtics with you and they're going to play I think the, the Celtics guards. will win this game. I, <laughs> I don't know if they I, – I still expect the Bucks to win the series at this point, but I think I think they'll do it in Boston. 
All right. Well, look, we can only live a day at a time. So give me game seven. We'll see what happens at that point. Jared Weiss from The Athletic for Evan Valenti, our producer, and of course, uh, oftentimes on air with us as well. I am Adam Kaufman. Let's enjoy our Friday nights, folks, hopefully, and uh, see if we can get Boston another win in Milwaukee. Jared, thanks as always. Take care, man.